Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, to whom I can go to seek counsel through her. His servants answered him, There is a woman in Endor who is a medium. So he disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and set out with two companions. They came to the woman by night, and Saul said to her, Tell my fortune through a ghost. Conjure up for me the one I ask you to. Wait, what? Saul puts on a costume and seeks out a woman to summon the dead? What sort of witchcraft is this? Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin, reading between the lines, where we look at interesting topics and questions related to the Bible. And despite that little bit of proof texting out of context, the passage that you just heard is not about Halloween. It's from 1 Samuel, and in fact, what he did was actually very much opposed to the law, which is why he disguised himself so he wouldn't be caught seeking out a medium to summon the dead. And while it is an interesting tale... That's a story for another time. Indeed. And it does bring up some prohibitions about some of the things we often associate with Halloween. The question that we are asking, however, is whether or not Halloween is biblical and whether or not Christians should celebrate it. And this brings us to the question of what Halloween is today and where it came from. Halloween as celebrated today is relatively new, so one can safely say that it was not a biblical celebration, nor are there any celebrations that resemble modern Halloween in the Bible, at least none that are sanctioned by the Lord. So to answer the first question, no, Halloween is not biblical. And for some, that may be all you need to know to answer the second question. But perhaps a better question would be to ask is whether or not the celebration of Halloween is actually opposed to the teachings in the Bible. What are the origins of Halloween then? There are plenty of websites and videos in which you can research Samhain, the ancient Celtic celebration. Many see this as one of the earliest precursors of Halloween, especially due to the timing and traditions of the celebration, a harvest festival that took place on a day on which they believed the barrier between the world of the living and the dead was at its thinnest. Some research suggests that this pagan holiday began about 2,000 years ago in Ireland, and traditions include honoring the dead, which involved leaving food and drink for them, wearing costumes, feasting, of course, and warding off harmful spirits. But you also may be familiar with its connection to All Saints Day, which is where we get the word for Halloween, a kind of Scottish version of All Hallows' Eve, and that festival has gone through quite a number of iterations throughout the years. Today, All Saints Day is celebrated by a number of Christian traditions, including the Roman Catholic Church, Anglican, Lutheran, and Methodist, all on November 1st. The Eastern Orthodox, Syro-Malabar, Chaldean Catholic, and Coptic Orthodox churches celebrate it as well, but on different days. So what is All Saints Day, and what is its connection to Halloween? Halloween, of course, being the day before, or the eve of All Saints Day. As far back as the Old Testament, we typically see feasts beginning at sundown of the previous day, including the Sabbath. And while many of these festivals had religious overtones, they were typically seasonal celebrations, oftentimes adapted from those of their pagan neighbors, which is why the prophets had to continuously remind them about the true meaning of their festivals and warn them about falling back into pagan practices. Halloween follows similar lines. But before we get into that, let's go to New Testament times. As it was with almost all cultures throughout history, respect for the dead was an important virtue And there were many rituals in relation to death and burial. When John the Baptist was beheaded, some of his disciples took the body and laid it in a tomb. And when Stephen was martyred, Christians buried his body and mourned for him. It is interesting that in both these cases, it was not the family of the deceased, but rather those of the emerging church that celebrated their life and performed the burial. From this time onward, the Christian community continued to honor the faithful who had died, particularly those martyred due to their faith. This tradition of the apostles was carried forward by the church and eventually evolved into one celebration to honor all of the saints. In AD 350, Ephraim the Syrian spoke about this important practice of the church to honor all who have died. In the year 609, Pope Boniface IV repurposed and rededicated the Pantheon, which was a temple to the Roman gods. In the consecration of the site as a church, he dedicated it to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to the martyrs. He also officially established May 13th as All Saints Day. This date became quite popular, and many Christians would flock to Rome to celebrate, which would put a strain on the local economy. Well, on the food supply, to be more accurate. May was before the harvest, and Rome wasn't ready for the number of pilgrims who would come. 
Now, some historians believe that the date was moved to the first week in November because this was after the fall harvest, and they wanted to guarantee there would be enough food for all of the pilgrims. And others believe that November 1st was chosen as the new date for All Saints Day, sort of as a replacement for the popular harvest festivals that were often similar to or associated with Samhain. This was a common practice in which the competing religion would usurp a festival date and replace it with their own feast. Oftentimes, however, various cultural elements from the previous holiday would still remain, which is very evident with Halloween. This is not only seen in the European or American ways in which Halloween is celebrated, but in Mexico and other Latin American countries, it is often celebrated as All Saints Day, or El Día de los Muertos, in which both ancient traditions as well as various Catholic traditions are kind of merged together. Other similar holidays to remember the dead are celebrated throughout the world. In many ways, honoring and remembering those who died on a particular day is as much as part of the people's culture as it is a faith tradition. In fact, the celebration of All Saints Day in many churches is followed by All Souls Day. While the first celebrates those who are believed to be with God in heaven, the following remembers all those who have died. El Día de los Muertos tends to combine both ideas into one celebration, often lasting a few days. But what about the practices associated with these holidays? Are they opposed to the Bible? And we'll look at two aspects of this. First, the theological aspect, and then the more secular. And by theology, I mean the concept of honoring the dead and the practice of intercession of the saints. Now, most will agree on the idea that we shall honor and celebrate those who have died, particularly in the belief of the resurrection of all the faithful. We see this in the New Testament accounts of the martyrs and the apostolic tradition. In fact, in the account of Stephen's martyrdom, it says that he saw into heaven and witnessed the glory of God. He knew where he was going, and the church celebrates that with him. But can he pray for the church? I think the New Testament gives a pretty good case that he can. After all, in the letter to the Hebrews, the author tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The image is that of us running a race, and those in the stands are the faithful of the Old Testament, as well as the faithful Christians who have already received salvation. They are cheering us on, and presumably want us to succeed. Revelation 8, 3-4 also talks about how the prayers of the faithful are lifted up with the incense before God. Of course, not all Christians will interpret these passages the same, so we might ask, was this something that followed the teaching of the apostles? It seems that it was. For there is evidence of the practice of asking the saints to intercede as early as the 3rd century. The oldest known written prayer involving this practice is the sub tuum presidium, which petitions the Virgin Mary. We also see this concept in the writings of Origen, Clement of Alexandria, and Cyril of Jerusalem, a practice that has continued to this day. But what about all those biblical prohibitions against talking to the dead? Like Leviticus 20, verse 6, or Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. Even the prophet Isaiah speaks against this, as we hear. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Aren't those who have died, even in Christ, still deceased? Well, let's take each question in turn. First, the prohibitions were against necromancy and summoning the dead, specifically to get information from them, the way that Saul did in the intro. These were pagan rituals and were an abomination to God. It often involved false gods and demons as well. Possessing a dead body is forbidden! Another reason that it was forbidden is because God was speaking to his people through the law and the prophets. They did not need to seek elsewhere. But intercession is about asking the saints to pray for us to God, not to gain some sort of supernatural information. Also, Jesus himself spoke with the dead during the transfiguration when Elijah and Moses appeared with him. Secondly, Jesus tells his disciples that those who believe in him will not die. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He also assures the repentant criminal who was crucified with him that he would indeed be with him in paradise. So Jesus tells us that the faithful 
are actually alive and not dead. Jesus came to bring life. So if Christians believe in this cloud of witnesses that live with Christ, the communion of saints, would it be unreasonable to think that they communicate with the divine in heaven so that we can ask them to pray for us, just as we ask those here on earth? So what about the secular practices associated with Halloween? And I can just speak from my own experiences here in the United States. Dressing up in costumes, trick-or-treating, carving pumpkins, and party games. Some schools and churches still connect some of these things to All Saints Day, like dressing up as saints and learning about their lives. Others remove it a bit further and dress as heroes or others that they look up to, even if they be fictional characters. Then, of course, there is the scary aspect of Halloween, which I think has lost most of its original meaning in this country. There are a few aspects of the horror or ugliness of some of the decorations or costumes that actually go back to noble purposes. And one of these was the idea of trying to scare away the unclean spirits. This can be seen in the original meaning of gargoyles and jack-o'-lanterns. We even dress like monsters to proclaim that they have no power over us. We see this in one of the traditions of El Dia de los Muertos. Here, death is mocked to show that death is not to be feared, which is also a Christian understanding. We can laugh in the face of death because it has already been conquered by Christ. It is a way of confronting our own mortality and embracing the promise of new life. For Christians, after all, the tomb is now a symbol of life rather than death because of the Lord's resurrection. So what about the other aspects of Halloween? Well, trick-or-treating and parties are cultural traditions that bring neighbors and friends together, as most holidays are meant to do. For many, Halloween is simply a cultural holiday with no religious meaning at all. Even Paul says to the church of Colossae regarding their traditions, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however is found in Christ. Of course, he also warns them in that same letter. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So perhaps this is a good time to talk about the more darker side of Halloween, which I would be remiss if I were not to speak about. We talk about celebrating this feast or justifying celebrating this in light of what it says in the Bible, we might have to ask ourselves, what does the feast mean to us? Or what do I use it as an excuse to do? While it can be a time of fun and a way to remember the saints and our loved ones, it can also be something much more sinister. Involving ourselves in occult practices, consulting mediums, or seeking the advice of fortune tellers or Ouija boards would all be forbidden by the scriptures. Using it as an excuse to dress immodestly and lose ourselves to drunkenness is also a common practice on Halloween. I think this passage from Galatians sums up what Halloween has become for many, and also serves as a warning for those of faith. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But before you leave with the notion that the Bible is only about prohibitions and things that we are not supposed to do, the passage continues with these words. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In summary, Halloween is not biblical. But the way in which we celebrate these cultural festivals or religious holidays is what makes all the difference. What has it meant to you in the past or today? And how do you see it in light of the gospel? And so I'd love to hear from you. How is it that you celebrate Halloween or All Saints Day or El Dia de los Muertos? Please feel free to comment below. Thank you so much for watching. And if you're enjoying this content, please feel free to hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, God bless and keep reading between the lines.